Hi, everyone. I'm Maurice Samuels, the director of the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism, and I want to welcome you to this special webinar entitled Antisemitism After October 7. I know that while the war is still going on, it's hard to think about anything except anxiety and grief. But we nevertheless need to begin to take stock of the way that the massacre of October 7th has profoundly changed the way Jews view the world and the way the world views Jews. To help us sort through this complex situation, I've invited Kenneth Stern to speak with us today. He's an author and attorney and serves as the director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. Previously, he was director of the Division on Antisemitism and Extremism at the American Jewish Committee, where he worked for 25 years. Mr. Stern's op-eds and book reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Forward, and the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, and other places too. His newest book, the Conflict Over the Conflict, the Israel-Palestine Campus Debate was published in 2020. I'm very grateful to Ken for agreeing to join us on very little notice today. I can think of few people better qualified to discuss the issue of anti-Semitism. So here's how the webinar will work. Uh, I will engage Ken in discussion for about 30 minutes. Uh, then we'll take 30 minutes of questions from the audience and we'll end right around 6 p.m. So please submit questions at any time during the discussion using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I will relay the questions during the, the question period. The chat function has been disabled. And I should say that American Sign Language uh, interpretation is being provided live and can be accessed by pinning the ASL interpreters. So I realize this topic has aroused a lot of passion, but I want to discuss it today in as calm and rational a manner as possible. And I urge you to write questions in that spirit. Um, and I urge you to keep the questions focused on the issue of anti-Semitism. You know, there are many other topics like the how you know Israel should conduct the war, things like that, that we really can't get to today. So with that said, let's start uh, the discussion. There's there's a lot to get to. So and hi, Ken. Maury, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk with your audience. I'm, as you know, I'm a fan of your work and I'm just honored to be able to have this discussion with you tonight. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, and welcome to everybody here. Um, so let's get started. So right after October 7th, as the horror of the massacre emerged, uh, there was an outpouring of revulsion against Hamas and sympathy for Israel. Then things began to change when Israel's bombing of Gaza started. Um, since then, we've seen some really scary anti-Semitic incidents around the world, um, including just in the last few days, things, it seems like things have been getting dramatically worse. Um, the attack on the airport in Dagestan was particularly scary. And in the U.S., things have gotten very scary. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League last week reported a 388% increase in anti-Semitic attacks since October 7th compared with a year earlier. So can you start by just saying what you think is going on? Um, how worried should we be? Um, is this a blip or a sea change? Um, maybe another way of saying that is, don't we always see a spike in violence against Jews after conflicts of the Middle East and then things settle down? So, but maybe not. I don't know. How do you see things? Well, it's very hard to predict the future. So, you know, we're at a moment now in the middle of things being totally shaken up. But you're right. If you look historically, um, there was a concern in the 73 Yom Kippur War where there was the Arab oil embargo. And those of us who are old enough to remember, you know, we had to go on even days and odd days to fill up our tanks. And it was a concern that Jews were going to be blamed and they really weren't. Um, there was, you know, the attacks that happened really after the beginning of the Second Intifada after the peace process collapsed and there was a spike to me it was very reminiscent of what we're seeing maybe on a somewhat smaller scale but it was i remember the 
places in the United States and North America were having some synagogues that were being attacked, much more so in Europe. And then what happened was in the U.S. after a few weeks after the shooting stopped, it dissipated not so much uh, in, in Europe a little bit, but it still was at a level a lot higher than before. Um, what may be different now uh, is that we're at a point where the, uh, you know, the end of, of what's happening is not clear. And so, uh, you know, the, the continuing seeing of uh, pictures of civilians in Gaza uh, being pulled out of rubble and babies in hospitals and so forth, I think are, are going to contribute to uh, some of the, you know, continued uh, attention uh, to this. Um, and, you know, on, on campuses where we've seen issues before, the couple of the, I think it was, you know, 2000 and, uh, you know, let's see, 2000, I have a note down here, 2014, yeah, the, the attack, the war with Gaza, mm -hmm. Israel was in July, campus was out, and in 2008, it was January, so campus was out, so that's one of the other different yeah. factors here now, students are very much on campus, and organizing around this. So so on that question, I know a lot of people are just shocked by what's going on on college campuses. Um, are How do you see it? Are campuses hotbeds of anti-Semitism? Is it only at certain campuses? Is it, you know, it, it seems like the Ivy League campuses are getting the most attention, but, um, and certainly what happened at Cornell this week with those, you know, horrifying threats, you know, from a, a, a another student. So how do you understand what's happening on college campuses? Well, you're right. I mean, some of the, the incidents we've seen have been particularly disgusting, the Cornell one in particular, but there have been others too, threats of violence and so forth. Um, but in some ways, you know, this, this isn't new. I mean, you mentioned that I wrote a book on the conflict over the conflict uh, in 2020, and there was already, again, not on every college, or 4,000 colleges, Israel is a not a big issue on most of them, but on some of them it is. And on those campuses, uh, what's been transpiring for a number of years is this sort of binary view uh, where, you know, people get into their buckets of thinking, ah, you know, there's only justice on the Palestinian side. There's no justice on the Israeli side or vice versa. Um, and trying to suppress speech on, you know, each side. So we've had over the years, although not as ubiquitous as some people would, would uh, portray, incidents where Israeli or, or pro-Israel speakers were shouted down a heckler's veto. We've had uh, attempts to, um, you know, professors who had decided that their politics are more important to them than the responsibility to their students. So I'm not going to write a letter of recommendation for somebody to go study in, in Israel. You've had a, a push from time to time to have academic boycotts of, of Israel because, um, you know, people were so upset with, with the variety of things that Israel stands for or, or has done, not recognizing that in an academic setting, the purpose of it is to look at ideas when you segregate a, a nationality that's an abrogation. So we had that on, you know, on, on one side. We also had actually last year more of an escalation too, where you've had at Berkeley, uh, Vermont, and, and New Paltz some decisions to exclude Zionists from spaces, you know, like climate change or sexual survivor spaces, which tells me that you know that's sort of McCarthyism it's they ha may have a right to define their political groups but when you say you know a Zionist shouldn't be in this space it's the same as saying the 50s a communist can't be in the space even though it has nothing to do with with this mm -hmm. you know the politics on the flip side of this binary which I think mm -hmm. is very caustic to the campus you've had uh, attempts by the organized Jewish community um, to suppress some, you know, pro-Palestinian speech. Um, and there's a whole long history of trying to use the what's called the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, which I was the lead drafter of in its early text in its earlier iteration and trying to use it as a speech code to stop certain speech on campus. And you just had, you know, I, I think well, I, most people on this call would find the 
the Students for Justice in Palestine statements over the last couple of weeks were reprehensible or worse, but you had uh, Jonathan Greenblatt go in and uh, uh, Ken Marcus telling universities to go investigate. You had DeSantis kicking off SJP groups. That's also a violation of academic freedom. So you've had you know this sort of divide beforehand, but it's become on steroids now on, yeah. on the campus. And and that certainly, you know, was, um, you know, the case with the reaction to the Harvard students who, you know, came out right pretty soon after October 7th um, with, you know, um, a statement blaming Israel for the attacks. And then there was, you know, really a, a backlash against them and, you know, attempts to make their identities known so people don't don't hire them. What would you do you think that was an overreaction on the part of um, the Jewish community there or or Jewish donors to those to the Harvard students? And if so, what would have been a, a better uh, response? Yeah, I, I think it was pretty awful. I mean, these are 18, 19 and 20 year olds. Um, and you're going after them and saying they shouldn't be employed. They should have a, you know, a mark against them. It's a blacklist. I mean, what I'm, the reason why I'm against the academic boycott is also because it's a blacklist. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you fight blacklists, you know, with, with blacklists, the doxing and the, the mm -hmm. inherent threat of violence that comes with, you know, where you live and we're going to put a truck in front of your house. Uh, to, you know, to me is uh, disgusting, but that's not new. I mean, there's a thing called Canary Mission, which mm -hmm. has been around and um, has identified uh, students that the Canary Mission folks have objection to their some of their speech. And I share a lot of their objections. But when you create a, a list that sort of marks them, mm -hmm. um, that's so something what's a better. What should sure. we do then? Yeah. Yeah, so I think you speak out against it. I think you encourage others to speak out against you know that type of speech. You don't try to um, you know to to penalize it in the, because it is free speech, but you use on an academy. You use the tools you have at hand, right? You use the educational process to uh, mine uh, in a very difficult moment. And there mm -hmm. are things that you can do short term and things that you can do, you know, long term. Short term, I know a, uh, some, a colleague of, of ours, Susanna Heschel, and a few others immediately mm -hmm. did a, a very good program at, at Dartmouth. Um, there have been places, Bard and other places, too, that have done vigils. Uh, I think Williams as well. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at Bard last Thursday, I mean, the Bard has had a lot of a lot of programs. Um, mm -hmm. on this, but the one that we put together was looking at um, the issue of laws of war and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in the aftermath of this. Mm -hmm. And I had a subtext for that. It was very crowded. It was, you know, it was intense discussion. But I wanted students to get out of their binary boxes right. uh, and not to feed the binary. So the binary, you know, boxes again are. Israel is 100% responsible. This is all about the occupation. It's all about, you know, settler colonialism. And then the other side is the, wait a minute, this is, how could you not uh, condemn, you know, baby killing and some of the, I don't know if you saw the Blinken's testimony about some of the more gruesome yeah. uh, things that happened, you know, not condemn that. So what I wanted the students to realize was that, A, because we run a center for hate, that's, you know, it's not the first time hate has gotten to this point where their bombs are happening and people are getting shot and their mm -hmm. atrocities. And there's actually a rule of, of how you, you know, you deal with these things. And that's the, the rules of law. So I wanted them to, to see that and where both sides uh, may not be, you know, or certainly not. Well, one of the Hamas clearly in Israel, you can point to certain questions about whether they're living up to the laws of war. And then on the anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, I wanted them to understand uh, precisely how hatred works. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I, I when I have discussions about this topic, and actually a lot of discussions around you know the book, um, I go back to the the first chapter, which is uh, about how when our identity is tethered to an issue of, of social justice or injustice, our brains actually function differently. There's brain science that shows that. There's social psychology. There are other fields 
that show we, you know, our brains fire differently, that we try to reduce things to simplicity and all right and all wrong. We're allergic to complexity uh, and we just get further and further into our own bubbles. And when you sort of understand that that's what happens when we feel this way, I think it creates an intellectual space to be able to uh, engage with that more. So that was one of the things I shared with the students. Mm -hmm. And also about the, the uptick in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there have been uh, the murder of that, you know, six-year-old uh, child. And you know, I have a, a friend mm -hmm. in the UK who um, monitors online anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Both, of course, have spiked tremendously, but he said this is the first time we've seen them happen in tandem. Yeah. The, the, the point I want the students to come away with is this is how hatred works. This is, animates a certain number of people to feel justified to act on it with things of violence. You may not act. You're not going to act on it in a violent way, but some of the things that stir them are probably going on with you. And I wanted them to be able to reflect. Mm -hmm. So things like that. And I could talk about more things you can do on campus. Yeah. So what about just, you know, a, a kind of basic vexing question in anti-Semitism studies is how do you distinguish between legitimate criticism of Israel's policies, even the war and anti-Semitism? And you know, where do we put that line? And has, I, I, this is obviously a question I know you've thought a lot about, but has the recent war changed how you've thought about this question? It hasn't changed how I thought about it. I think, and I, and I wrote a piece um, for an Israeli think tank a couple of years ago about this, that basically that, you know, anti-Semitism at its core uh, is two things. Right, it's conspiracy theory that believe Jews are conspiring to harm humanity, and gives an explanation for what goes wrong in the world, from missing, you know, Christian children back in the blood libel days to Marjorie Taylor Greene and Jewish space lasers. Right, mm -hmm. so you know that's the core of of how anti-Semitism works. So if one is cut and pasting Israel and putting in that place, that's that's fine. On the other side of the spectrum there are Palestinian folks who are saying, wait a minute, Zionism means that basically Jews came and disrupted our ability to control our lives. And, you know, for, that's why they are anti-Zionists. They don't believe that there should be a Jewish state. Do they believe that Jews should be slaughtered like this? The ones that I converse with, no. They believe in a uh, you know one state with uh, everybody getting a vote. Now, that's a problem for Jews. I mean, it's not certainly a problem for Jews before October seventh. When you know who's going to trust that that's, that's going to work out hunky dory? Um, but you know, to me, that that you can make the argument that it's functionally anti-Semitic and anti-Palestinian because it, it it's going to be perpetual. Uh, warfare, but does that mean that they're motivated by hatred of Jews? No. Um, and when I teach about this, I use a, a essay by Derek Penzlar of Harvard. It's sort of a what if essay, and he talks about uh, what if it had been instead of Jews coming back to their historic homeland, it had been a, a Protestant group called the, the Templars that had come and reconstituted there. Would it have been more like the reaction to Rhodesia? Uh, so, you know, the to me, there's you know, clear instances where anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, clear instances where anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. And there's a whole bunch of gray in the middle, depending on intent and context right, I mean, and so forth. Yeah. So, so one of those instances. So last week on the Yale campus, there was a, a pro-Palestine walkout, um, they called it. I, I saw it. And um, there were signs saying, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Um, and many, including the Anti-Defamation League, consider this slogan anti-Semitic. Um, I think they see it as a kind of dog whistle implying the extermination of Jews or at least the erasure of Israel. Um, but other people don't see that as anti-Semitic. So how that seems to be one of the, you know, kind of gray areas. How do you understand that? That's yeah, as, yeah, as a concrete yeah. example. Yeah. I mean, precisely it's ambiguous because somebody could mean 
we just, yeah, from the river to the sea, we're going to wipe out all the Jews and take it over. And that's one way that that could be interpreted. It could also mean from the river to the sea, we're going to have a democratic society where this one person, one vote. And so, you know, the the context of it is important. Um, you know, and I, and I think one of the problems with you know, looking about anti-Semitism is, again, you know, we want to get into that comfort space where we say, oh, it's clearly anti-Semitic or, ah, it's not anti-Semitic at all. And there are a lot of things that are much more ambiguous. And I think to the extent that we say, okay, how do we look at this problem uh, rather than sticking in one pin or another and then moving on, I think the the better we're we're able to understand it and what to do about it. Okay. Um, So I'm going to shift a little bit to talk about... um, the American government's reaction to October 7th. Um, And, you know, I think it was pretty, you know, striking that the Biden administration has been, you know, very strongly, at least initially, um, supportive of of Israel in the wake of the attack. How do you um, understand that? So this is now we're talking about maybe the opposite of anti-Semitism here. Um, is it, uh, and do you see it beginning to weaken now? Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I was impressed where the Biden administration, other some other foreign leaders too uh, came out because they, you know, see a lot of different interests involved. One is just on the moral tone, the slaughter and the brutality uh was you know absolutely revolting um and you know as a leader i presume you think what would you do if that happened to your people and what would the responsibilities be uh so the full-throated support of israel to be able to deal with this is is not surprising now the devil is in the details right so there's a you know i'm Again, you don't want to go too far into the conflict situation, but I, I'm not convinced that one can wipe out Hamas. It's an idea, and maybe there'd be something worse that comes. I'm not sure what the plans are for the day after, but I've also seen the Biden administration, you know, uh, to my satisfaction, at least uh, publicly, talking about there. These are the lessons from Afghanistan. This mm-hmm. is what this is. This is you know the rabbit hole you may be going down. You know, don't make the same mistakes we did. And then also having, you know, concerns for um, civilians. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so whether that's going to change, if the bombing continues, I don't know. I mean, um, it's certainly a a possibility uh, that it may change. And one of the calculations, again, Mm -hmm. is that you've seen some, you know, progressive Democrats yeah. who are, you know, I fully understand it, seeing the, the you know, when you see dead babies and you don't think, gee, this should stop, um, there's a, you know, there's a challenge there. And some of those folks are saying they're so upset with Biden for not stopping Israel from this uh, response that they're never going to vote for him. And so is that going to be something that's going to be, this is, you know, the support of Israel, if he loses the election, some are going to have that narrative. Right. And is, you know, I mean, it just seems to me like, okay, so that means that Trump will be elected next time. Is that going to be great for progressive causes? That seems to be a, you know, a, a really, you know, I understand that, you know, perhaps they're, you know, these progressive groups feel like they need to threaten loss of support for Biden. But, you know, I think that that just seems like a completely irrational response. But anyway, that's my own editorializing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about um, Jewish groups who are anti-Zionist or, you know, maybe not even anti-Zionist, but really oppose this this war and are calling for a ceasefire. Um, how do you understand that? Is that, um, you know, do you put that in the same category as, you know, um, different forms of anti-Zionism that do cross the line to anti-Semitism? I guess another way of saying that is, you um, are there, um, you know, do you see that uh, are Jews exempt from anti-Semitism, or how do you how do you understand that um, Jewish uh, anti-Zionist response? 
Yeah, Jews aren't exempt from anti-Semitism. Jews could be anti-Semitic, just like you know, black people could be racist and so forth. That being said, I, I see a debate inside the Jewish community, and this is one of the things that disturbs me about some of the you know the pushing of the definition on for application on campuses, saying uh, to be Jewish means you have to have an identity with Israel, you have to be a, a Zionist. Um, I'm a Zionist. Israel is a, uh, part of my Jewish identity. But I realize that for some Jews, that's not in fact the case. And, you know, I interviewed a, a number of them when I was putting together the book. And, and the, again, I don't have data for this particular thing, but a lot of anecdotes. And the anecdotes, you know, sort of go something like this. Um, I went to Jewish day school. A lot of the people, and if not now uh, in particular, and also JVP, I think some, um, you know, had Jewish education. And some of them uh, are children and grandchildren of Jewish communal uh, staff and lay leaders. I had a Jewish education. I go to college. And for the first time, I hear there's something called an occupation. And I feel betrayed and what's going on. And I learned about how we treat the stranger. I learned about repairing the world. I can't justify the existence of a Jewish state on top of a Palestinian population uh, as something that comports with my Judaism. Now, I can argue with them. I can disagree with them. But who am I to say that they're you know, outside the tent of what being Jewish should mean? Yeah. Um... Okay, and maybe one last question that I'll ask you before going to the um, uh, to the questions from the audience. Sure. And I do ur urge you all to um, put questions in the Q and A function. Um, so, who has a right to talk about these issues? You know, um, I think that a lot of Jews feel like, um, you know are suspicious when, uh, you know, they can certainly understand why Palestinians, maybe all Arabs are concerned about this. They can maybe understand why other Jews are concerned about this on both sides. But I think there's sometimes some suspicion why non-Jews are so energized about this question. And how do you see that? Like who has a right to, you know, talk about these issues on, on campuses or, or elsewhere? I think anybody has a right to talk about these issues, but the, you know, sort of, if you look back at the sort of timeline of where, um, you know, there's sort of been a left wing critique of, of Israel, it's an interesting timeline and it goes a lot with the, you know, the politics and progressive movement, which I consider myself part of historically. If you look back at the National Lawyers Guild resolution of 1948, and the Lawyers Guild is a progressive organization that uh, has been, you know, very much in the forefront of, of, of work opposing the Israeli, you know, government. Um, 1948 resolution reads like a Leon Uris novel. It, it's mm -hmm. like you know, support the Haganah. The Arabs are attacking. Why? Because at that moment in time, Israel was seen as socialist and anti anti-colonialist and the Russians were, you know, supportive. And so that was the political dynamic. Mm -hmm. then, then you have, uh, I think 67 was a watershed where a lot of uh, progressives and, you know, not aligned countries and so forth said, what's going on here and started to see the, this is a, you know, flip to, to a, adopting the Palestinian narrative as opposed to the uh, Israeli one. Um, then you started seeing, um, you know, the left. I mean, if you look at the the political statement of the Weather Underground, it reads like a contemporary mm -hmm. thing from SJP. Um, so it's been part of the, I think, you know, there were times where there were certain movements that people co coalesced around South Africa and uh, anti-war and so forth. And this has the imagination, partly because I think a lot of people are concerned um because you know the holy land is is an important place it's a u.s ally it gets a lot of money gets a lot of attention um but there's you know it's also become one of those binary you know good and bad uh you know symbols and again when we're talking about a, a campus the, the thing to me is to try to break down that binary to show it's more you know complicated so 
there are have been some efforts to do that, but I'll I'll give you one thing that came up in in um, my talk at, at at Bard. I mean, one of the simple or binary, how do we look at this and we don't have to think mm -hmm. about it is Israel's a settler colonial state. End of story. Okay. Right. So it's it's you know the indigenous people are being hurt. And I have in my book, I have the two competing narratives and they're you know they're they sort of fly by each other at, at night. But I had this couplet that I, I, I pointed out to a student who was pushing this. And um, I talked about the fact that there was a, there's a group called ACPI, the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. It sent a letter to the Iroquois Confederacy in New York um, because the Iroquois folks have a lacrosse, as they claim to have invented it, they're very much involved in international lacrosse. There was going to be an international lacrosse tournament in uh, Tel Aviv. And they said, you're indigenous like us. You're a victim of settler colonialism like us. It will be a betrayal for you to come. Don't. And then I contrast it with a, an article, a short couple of paragraphs from uh, Judea Pearl, you may know as the teachers at UCLA or did it. His son, Daniel Pearl, was a journalist who was beheaded. Mm -hmm. And he said, name me another settler colonial state where you have people speaking the language that was spoken there before the you know, so-called indigenous folks. Name me another place where people have been talking about in their poetry and lore and religion for you know thousands of years of settler colonialists. Name me another place where um, you name cities, New York, New Berlin, New Baghdad, you know, not those things but names that they had in, in you know, times of the Bible. Um, and then I quote a, a historian who says, um, real history is the ability to navigate both those things simultaneously. The rest is communal advocacy. And the mm -hmm. more I think we can underscore that complexity to, to look at and really understand the narratives, that, that's a good thing. And one, one final point too is I tell students uh, and, and I've been speaking on a lot of campuses even before this, that you know, none of them are going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. All of them have control over how they treat their classmates. Mm -hmm. It's fine if they have strong you know, political views on this. Um, and you know, as part of being a, a good advocate, don't they want to engage with people who have a different point of view? You'll learn more from people that have a different point of view on um, mm -hmm. people that agree with you. And I tell them, I used to be a criminal trial lawyer. You know, if I didn't, uh, I, I was, if I didn't think about how the prosecution would present its case, and was just focusing on what I wanted to say, but not having the imagination to think about how they were going to approach it, I would have been committing malpractice. So right. the more you make it as an educational good to have the, the emotional capacity and the intellectual curiosity, um, the better off I think things will be. Yeah. Okay. So we have a, a lot of questions um, and several of the questions are grouped around this issue. So someone says, um, yesterday, Harvard and UPenn announced the formation of advisory boards to combat anti-Semitism. Why isn't the battle against anti-Semitism included or already included as part of existing DEI, so diversity, equity, and inclusion infrastructure. So as everyone, maybe people who aren't part of universities don't know that there is, you know, there is a whole DEI infrastructure on every campus and Jews seem to be left out of that. So why do we, you know, why is that? It, it depends on where. There's some places mm -hmm. where, where you know, anti-Semitism is included. I've done some training for some places and some places where it's not. And there are places before, you know, this that have decided they really wanted to wrestle with issues of anti-Semitism. And Lila Coral and Berman at, at Temple put together a, a commission that really looked at, at the issue. And, and it really just isn't you know question of support for students which is important mm -hmm. uh, or to think about it for administrators but it's also to, to think about it for curriculum i think there needs to be more classes on anti-semitism mm -hmm. but there also needs to be more classes on how do you have difficult discussions on issues that cut you to the core um about the importance of academic freedom and free speech about uh i think part of the challenge on campus and i, I think this is partly 
some of, of what goes under DEI, and I'm, again, supportive of a lot of it, but I see sometimes where the message is students should not be disturbed by ideas. If you're going to be disturbed by ideas, you know, oh, my God, we've got to protect you. You're fragile. To me, you know, nobody should be harassed. Nobody should be discriminated against. Nobody should be threatened. Uh, nobody should be bullied. Mm-hmm. But if you're not getting disturbed by ideas on a college campus, you know, why are you spending all that money to go? There? Right. But do you think that um, I mean, several people have pointed out that um, Jews don't seem to be treated as a minority worthy of, um, you know, uh, um you know, diversity, um, sensitivity on campus, you know, is, do you, do you feel like that's true? Um, you know, um, like, and that certain things that, you know, people have pointed out that are, you know, you would never hear about other minority groups are kind of tolerated when it comes to, to Jews on campuses. It, d- it depends on the campus and it depends on the context. So, um, you know, there are a lot of campuses Jews, a lot of campuses that have have a lot of a lot of Jews. Um, there is some, you know, tendency among some folks on the left to uh, again to go into these binary spaces where Jews are white, Jews are privileged. How can you have uh, discrimination against them? And that's that's not new, um, and that's hurtful. When I, you know, 20, 30 years ago, when I was doing training, I would saying you know for a jewish student who hears that something that happens to them uh can't possibly be hurtful because they're white um that's doubly dismissive because they think that the people that ought to you know know understand don't so that that happens in some places but i mm-hmm. i for you know the majority of what i've been able to see again i haven't done a survey of all four thousand campuses um mm-hmm. is that if there's something that's clearly anti-Semitic, you know, uh, white, uh, uh, white supremacist, uh, you know, leafleting or something, that'll be dealt with. When it comes to Israel, it's mm-hmm. much more complicated. Yeah. And it's again, you have Jewish students who are taking the position that is anti-Zionist. I mean, there's a whole kerfuffle about that speech at the CUNY graduate uh, at the law school where the you know uh, uh, somebody was giving a, a virulently anti-Israel speech, and the Jewish law student group was supportive of it. So you have a variety, um, and you also have Palestinian students. And mm-hmm. when you have um, you know a pushback on something that's not clearly anti-Semitic, but may make Jewish students who have a, a, a Israel identity as part of it. Um, then you, you know, do something to harm the Palestinian students too. So the, the better response is not just to think about how am I going to go flag that type of speech? It's how do I bring people together to have, you know, conversations? How should I change the academy so that people know they're not going to be harassed, but they are going to be disturbed? And then what are we going to do with that, you know, being disturbed? And and what about, um, you know, someone is asking, you um, If you really do, you know, feel that um, the, you know, there should be an immediate ceasefire uh, in the war right now. And then some people are saying that that's anti-Semitic to to say that. How do you respond? How do you respond to that? God, I'm glad I don't have to make, you know, those decisions about what to do or what not to do in this context. You know, I, I... as a human being, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, the the you know the civilians that are dying in in Gaza. Uh, it's heartbreaking. Um, I think you know Israel has a, a right to defend it. I mean, I was asking an ethicist who's a philosopher friend of mine. You know, at the beginning of this, I said to get out the hostages. That's an obligation for you know any country. But, you know, when you do that, you're going to cause a lot of civilian damages. How do you how do you weigh that? You know, and he said, basically, heck, if I know there's a rule of war. So there's, you know, Israel went after commanders, but a lot of collateral damage. How many, you know, so I don't know what to do. I don't think think there are some that are, you know, 
clearly don't want Israel to do anything at all. And to me, you know, that may be an indication of something that uh, is problematic because if, you know, the United States were attacked from Canada and then say, oh, don't respond, that, that wouldn't be an appropriate response. But to have concerns about um, human beings and thinking about, a, you know, other ways forward other than uh, just bombing the heck out of the place, mm-hmm. um, that's, I think that's reasonable and not, not anti-Semitic. But again, it depends on the context and what the motivations are. Okay. And um, there are a few questions about, you know, trying to understand um, what is motivating some, and this is a hard question, but what's motivating a lot of the anti-Israel sentiment right now? Is it, um, do you think that it's, you know, um, unleashing prejudice that was already there? Um, And another way of putting this is, um, you know, what's motivating, for instance, you know, I, I was reading an article yesterday about um, anti-Semitism on the Chinese internet, you know, and so um, is that purely um, sympathy for Palestinians or do you think that there are other things going on here? Um, yeah. I think it, I think there's probably not one simple, you know, situation. I think there are some that, you know, glom on to the, you know, good and bad and Palestinians are oppressed and Israelis are oppressors. Uh, and they, you know, feel some sort of comfort in that. Some of them may be uh, going after Israel because it, it's a Jewish state. Uh, that's certainly, I suspect, some uh, aspect of it. But I think, you know, so, some of it is, you know, again, seeing the pictures, having the concerns. Um, and, you know, it's it's a, it's a variety of things that I think motivate people. But... It, as what concerns me is that as long as this goes on, um, that's going to be, uh, you know, a, a challenge. And, you know, I have, I have friends, non-Jewish, um, who, you know, are, are sympathetic to Israel, but also at a gassed, you know, at what's going on and thinking about a ceasefire and all that. And I don't know, you know, at, at what point does, um, do you create, uh, you know, some more antipathy um, to Israel when, you know, there are 10,000 dead babies, 20,000, you know, at what point uh, does that create, you know, a tremendous, aside from the dead people, does that, you know, create challenges for Israel? I don't know. I'm glad I don't have to make decisions about what to do. Yeah. So here's a a question um, that I know is on a lot of people's minds. Um, How do you think social media has impacted the the landscape of anti-Semitism, especially maybe on college campuses? I think it gives an opportunity for people to, uh, you know, put things that are hateful very quickly, uh, you know, out there. But, um, you know, to to me, that. there's a whole discussion about hate and, and social media and whether um, things should be regulated even before, you know, October uh, 7th. And to me, it's, it's about the ideas more than the, the medium. I mean, people were worried about hate uh, when the printing press was put together and, you know, one can make the case that the most hateful, you know, thing about Jews was probably things, some things in the new Testament. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, you, television, radio, Father Coughlin, uh, early internet sites. So they're all different ways and they all communicate in ways a little differently. So I think it's it's part of the puzzle. It allows people to communicate and build sense of community. But I think it also gives an opportunity um, that we haven't fully tapped yet. And it's one of the things in, in the center that we're looking at is how do we use social media more effectively against hate? I mean, to me, mm-hmm. it's... It, um, I'm sort of aghast that, you know, we see hate crimes and there's no real easy mechanism for people uh, to use, you know, social media um, to know what their resources are, how to report a hate crime, all those things. So there are ways of building mm-hmm. up our capacity to fight hate a lot better using social media. It's it's a it's a double-edged sword. And to give you one, you know, f- final example of that, just so that, you know, people understand the context. I, I mean, Back at the time 
of the Oklahoma City bombing. It was the early internet days, and there were a bunch of us watching the militia movement with its anti-Semitism and its, its hatred of federal officials really start taking shape from one group to two groups, to 10 groups to 20 groups in a couple of months all around the, the, you know, the country, more than that even. And so a bunch of us got together and were watching the what they were posting on these early bulletin boards. So it gave the haters an opportunity to feel community, to spread rumors, to organize in a way that they hadn't had before. But it gave us an opportunity to also get a better sense of what they were doing, which is why a bunch of us put a warning of watch for April 19th, the anniversary of Waco, something's likely to happen. So it's most of these things are double-edged swords. Yeah, it's a, that's a great point. Yeah, how can we use social media um, to solve the problem rather than just let it keep causing it? So a question about statements. Um, you know, I think that um, after October 7th, immediately there, there seemed to be this war over statements. And especially, I think, on university campuses, you know, um, were university presidents quick to put out a statement? Were the statements sufficiently pro-Israel or were they too pro-Israel? Um, how do you uh, explain just the passion that the the statement question aroused? And do you think statements are a good thing? Um, what's what's your statement on statements? Well, I think people see sort of see it as a symbol and they try almost with you know, Talmudic uh, intensity, try to dissect it and does it, you know, is it sufficient? Is it insufficient? Does it cover, you know, what I care about or is, does it go to the other side? Is it all those things? There's a, a University of Chicago based uh, report that came out in the 60s called the Calvin Report that basically said universities really ought to avoid stepping into you know making political statements and i think basically that's right i mean i did two statements when i was at hjc that got over 400 college presidents to sign one was when we saw attacks on the hillel building at berkeley and concordia was a riot you know in 2002 with Yehuda Reinhardt, who's in a brandeis and late jim friedman from dartmouth and a bunch of others we put together a statement that talked about the college president's responsibility to the campus to uh, not allow harassment, not allow intimidation, to keep it open to ideas and so forth. And then in 2007, I worked with Lee Bollinger and about 400 other college presidents, including Harold Shapiro of Princeton, who's um, when the university and college union in the UK put out a statement advancing an academic boycott of Israel. And so we got about 400 some odd to sign on to Lee's statement, which was if that union was intent on dividing the academic world into Israelis who should be shunned and um, everybody else count us as Israelis. This is the same time the ADL was floating, gee, maybe we should uh, boycott British academic institutions, which in my view was you know ridiculous to change the debate from should we have academic boycotts to who should be boycotted. But the principle mm -hmm. of both of those statements was looking at the campus and academic freedom and what the campus mm -hmm. should be. And the Calvin report says that, that that's fine. So what I was advising when this was happening is, yeah, it's imp I think it's important for presidents not to be seen as silent and ignoring this. I think it's perfectly appropriate to put out something that says we know our students are are hurting. Uh, I think, and to what are the resources? I think it's important to talk about what the campus can do at this time, this educational mission and how we should be treating each other. But to make a statement about, even though personally, you know, I would have deplored obviously what Hamas was doing, as a president, I probably would not have. And I think Maud Mandel at Williams put out a really smart statement. It was a mm -hmm. statement about why she wasn't putting out a statement. Mm -hmm. But it was very clear that she was focusing on on what the campus should do as opposed to, you know, don't expect the president's office to be the State Department. Right. But I, you know, I understand that. And I am sort of against statements also, I wish they had never gone down that road to begin with. But I can also understand the other point of view, which is once universities start putting out statements when some groups are yeah. hurt, 
why are Jews left out? You know, why doesn't the massacre of Jews merit a statement or why, you know, so I, I do understand that, that, that side also. Um, right. But, but I understand that too. And that's why I think it's a, probably a better policy not to put it out, but you know, I don't remember anybody, you know, getting up on campus and, and there may have been some students, but I don't remember people organizing saying, you know, that uh, George Floyd got a coming uh, mm-hmm. or back in the apartheid South Africa days, somebody saying apartheid is a good thing. Right. On this issue, you have a, a lot of divisiveness on the campus. And, you know, so I don't see campuses putting out positions on abortion. I don't see campuses saying, you know, leave aside the 501c3 problems, you know, you should be opposing Trump. Right. But I'm just going to push back on that because I think you could say, well, but isn't, you know, uh, the massacre of innocent people in Israel like an inherent um, moral, you know, um, catastrophe that needs to be denounced um, at that time? Isn't it? And isn't it the responsibility? of the university to take a clear moral stance on something like that? I, the, the answer is I, as an individual, would. Um, but as a university president, I'd be very hesitant. To, I mean, they haven't put out statements about you know the earthquake in Turkey. They haven't put out statements about a lot of other I don't remember about the Uyghurs. You know, I mean, you could talk, mm-hmm. this, this was this was an atrocity that, that, that um, was just you know uh, unfathomable Mm -hmm. and i think there are opportunities on a campus to educate about this and Mm -hmm. i am concerned about students who are so in that 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 tunnel that they can't even to tick a box say you know killing babies is not such a good thing but we still Mm -hmm. are supporting for palestinian rights um or saying you know i have a colleague who teaches at rutgers who was telling me that one of the pro Hamas students was a student who thought Hamas was a person. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ignorance out there and not knowing about what the Hamas is and its original charter and how it treats gays and women. And so, so there's a lot of, a lot of education there, but there is some, um, you know, again, it's, it, it's to me, I'm more interested in what a a college president does to use the educational. uh, Right. I mean, I, yeah, well, I was just saying, yeah, I, I agree that, that, yeah, that, that, you know, statements are inherently reductionist, you know, and it's, it's kind of contrary to the mission of what the university is supposed to do, which is to give deep context and, and to teach about things. So this leads to work because we're sort of running sure. out of time, it leads to some other questions, sure. people pushing back on, on the call precisely for, um, you know, the response to anti-Semitism being more education, how, or, you know, how do you, do that when people seem so dug in on this issue that they just don't want to learn and um or they're just so completely ignorant that they're they're just not willing you know to learn and are you know taking these these um knee-jerk positions on either side how then does education become the answer to in a situation like that that's so hot you know resistant to it yeah, that's a it's a great question. I think you know part of uh, again what a university needs to do is broader than just looking at this question. It's the culture of being disturbed by ideas of finding new classes again, new classes on anti semitism, new classes on hatred, and and um, you know the why people hate and why we get into these boxes. Um, more programs that that bring in uh, people with different points of view to model how you can disagree on strongly divergent uh, views, classes on how to do that. Um, Those things, I think, over time will set the tone. um, And it it comes from the university leadership. It comes from the faculty. uh, And the more we can empower those voices, is it it gonna be like a silver bullet? No. But I think ultimately that's the best tool that a campus has. And when mm-hmm. it goes down the other road of saying we find this speech so deplorable that we're going to censor it, it just feeds into the binary, which is the problem, you know, in the first place. There's also an opportunity here uh, 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 that, you know, campuses have 
a turnover of at least a quarter of their students every year. So are you going to, with programs now, change a lot of minds? Probably not, although I think some were changing mm -hmm. the program that, that I participated in, I'm sure programs in other places. But you have, you know, next year and the year after, and I think, you know, it's more of an expectation when students come in mm -hmm. of how do you treat each other? How do you understand? You know, uh, those things will, will help set that up a little bit better. And okay, that leads into um, another question that someone had, which is how should university administrations um, manage these protests, um, and, you know, uh, anti anti Israel protests, to make sure that they don't become opportunities for anti Semitic expression. I I think you know anti Semitic expressions are awful, but they're First Amendment protected. So you're not going to you're going to punish a student who's going to say uh, you know like in Cornell make make true threats. Be very clear on that. But you also want to um, encourage the student body to realize that there are things that are being said that are really hurtful or perceived as hurtful by people and to understand the more of the context of it. So they're going to take a position that I, as a Zionist, feel um, you know cuts me to the quick. They at least ought to know how to how to you know deal with that um and on the flip side again is to have a, a perception that when you hear something it, you're not fragile you're gonna you know figure out how you're gonna i remember at bard years ago i walked onto the campus and there was a big free palestine sign i had not seen that before and it sort of made me very uncomfortable um and then i thought about it and i thought that's somebody who has an opinion I strongly disagree with. Uh, I understand it makes me deeply uncomfortable, but you know I would be more uncomfortable if the administration said they can't express themselves. And again, you know, finding opportunities. There, there are ways. I mean, there are small groups to bring together, which I've done of people that are strongly opposed on this issue but want to have the conversation, and with tech study and so forth. Um, does it necessarily change minds? No, but it, it's a, a possibility. I'll give you one other example. And this is, I have a blueprint for this at the end of the book. It's a class I love that a woman named Natasha Gill came up with. It was a um, simulation course. So half the course was students basically being actors. And the course was looking at the appeal commission. Uh, of the 30s. So for those who don't uh, recall, the, the Brits, when they had the mandate, said, Lord, Peel to figure out what the heck are we going to do with this? And they talked to everybody, Arabs and Jews, and um, came up with a, a, a report of, of what to do. So this is before the Holocaust, before 48, before 67, before contemporary times. So the guts of the conflict. And it was well-structured. She gave students uh, roles opposite uh, that would be an easy one for her. So she gave a pal uh, Pakistani Muslim, had to be eight weeks faithfully representing David Ben-Gurion. And when I talked to the student about it, she said, you know, as strange as that was for me, it was probably stranger for my Israeli classmate who had to be the Mufti. Mm -hmm. And as much as a pain in the butt he was, the Jabotinsky figure on my side was worse to deal with. So, you know, like a, a little bit of reality. And what I loved about it is Natasha told me that, you know, students would come in and say, gee, we can figure out how this conflict should have been resolved, you know, uh, 80 years ago. And they come out of it saying, now we understand why it hasn't been resolved in 80 years. That's education. And the more things we can do like that, the better. Okay, well, we are um, out of time and there are, you know, just many, many more um questions here that um, I'm going to ask my assistant Anessa to um, at least take pictures of and, and we can send you one thing um, before we go. Someone asked for just the reference to the Derek Penzlar um, article. Sure. If, I'll give you my email. So if you want that or anything else, please feel free to email. It's K Stern. So K-S-T-E-R-N at bard, B-A-R-D dot E-D-U.
Okay, terrific. Thank you. And thank you to all um, the participants for your great questions. And I apologize not for not being able to answer um, or to ask all of them. I urge everybody, you're probably already on our mailing list, but if you're not, please do sign up. There, We're going to have more um, uh, events around this conflict, but also other events that had been already scheduled um, on very interesting topics, including, you know, right-wing anti-Semitism and, um, you know, other um, things relating to the Middle East, too. So um, thank you all for attending, and a special thanks to Ken Stern um, for these, you know, very helpful and, and interesting uh, comments today. You can't hear everyone clapping, but I will uh, clap for everyone else and um you know let's hope that this you know ends soon yeah yeah thank you more thank okay. you everybody thanks everyone bye